today we are uh, hosting uh, this in a hybrid uh, mode. Uh, we are also live in the conference room on the 8th tower. At the, same, at the same time, we're going to have also presence uh, online. And uh, I'm hoping there's some more people going to be probably walking in, so just giving them a couple of minutes to get just joined. All right, so in interest of time, we're going to get started. Uh, I'm going to first uh, share the screen to uh, share the slides that will provide you transmission of uh, the information for uh, the Rutgers uh, CME. So for your uh, CME points, please text 17028 to number 888-816-4893. This is a customary step for uh, getting your CME points as an SMS message. And for your MLC credit uh, for today, you'll have uh, the, quiz uh, the quiz available at the uh, link that will be circulated one more time. And the room code is future46, future46. And both the steps uh, will need to be uh, entertained for getting the MLC uh, credits. All right, so with, uh, with that, uh, we go into our grand run for today. I'm uh, really Please, uh, with today's initiative. So every time we come and think about the New Brunswick campus, we are reminded of great entrepreneurs, educators, who decided to serve the community. And uh, I'm thrilled uh, and honored to introduce one such name today, Dr. Jarrell Vogel, who is uh, uh, really uh, credit credited for his uh, work not only as an uh, academic cardiologist, but also for his intense uh, involvement with the community. And uh, as we will see very shortly when he presents, that he's an innovator, entrepreneur, and really uh, very uh, connected to the science that he has tried to develop in the community um, uh, that he has been spearheading for a fairly long time. and. Uh, his uh, introduction uh, probably is uh, necessary because many of us who are training here would not know about his uh, connection, a profound connection with many um, stalwarts in cardiology that uh, will resonate when he's presenting. He's currently the, uh, known as the founding partner for the Central Jersey Cardiovascular Associate. He's the board certified in internal medicine, cardiology, nuclear cardiology, sleep medicine. He received his MD degree from Downstead Medical Center in New York and continued his training at U.S. Public Health Service. He's certified by ABIM with the specialty certification in cardiology, nuclear cardiology, sleep medicine. Uh, he is uh, certified by, in sleep medicine by the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. In addition, he's a fellow of uh, American College of Cardiology. Dr. Vizfogel is also a fellow of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine and was the first cardiologist in the country to become board certified in this discipline. Uh, he has been participating as a speaker in several multi, uh, major institutional and uh, specialty conferences throughout the country, and he has uh, uh, lectured enormously. He has uh, uh, help develop the integration of sleep screening uh, and treatment with CHF and pulmonary artery hypertension clinics in, in his community practice here. He was the medical director of the congestive heart failure programs at the Mervic Care Center in Plainsboro, New Jersey, 
uh, and also in South Playful, New Jersey, was the founder and medical director of the Diagnostic Vascular Associate uh, in Northeast, where he helped pioneer the use of digital cardiac catheterization imaging, small catheter, and power injection for the coronary arteries. Uh, Dr. Westfogel is the former chief of cardiology at JFK Hospital in Edison, New Jersey, and is on the staff at uh, Robert Wood uh, Johnson University Hospital in New Brunswick, New Jersey. But when I met him very briefly and he came and introduced himself, uh, what struck me uh, enormously was his passion, uh, his commitment for excellence in areas, and his deep intense of curiosity, and he's easily excitable. Uh, he even now continued to ask me and uh, uh, was interested to find out how he could contribute to academic medicine in the current setting. And to top all of that was his intense humility. I think he has contributed enormously, uh, as you will clearly see in cardiology, but his humility and also his uh, uh, intense uh, pursuit uh, for uh, continu continuously innovating and as an entrepreneur bringing in new technology and new speciality, that was very striking. So. A lot of people who feel like uh, they do not have an intent to pursue uh, as a faculty in academic cardiology, here is a perfect example who is an innovator who has really participated on both sides uh, providing service uh, in the community. At the same time, he has excelled in bringing new frontiers of innovation in cardiology. So with that, with great uh, honor and uh, uh, engagement, I'm Presenting to you, Dr. Westphal, and talking talk about, about, about this uh, uh, area of interest in athletic medicine. Dr. Westphal. Thank you, Partha. Uh, quite an introduction, and um, you know, if I'm, I don't know if I'm up to all the good things you said about me. Um, I'm really uh, honored to, uh, to be part of your series. It's been uh, very illuminating. Every week there's something that's, that's wonderful new, and uh, really, it's really an honor to be here. Um, can I do this right? You're on. So, So this talk is uh, cardiology and sleep. I, ha I have no disclosures other than I'm very passionate about this field. Um, in 2005, there was a uh, editorial in the Lima Journal of, of Medicine called Sleep, the New Cardiovascular Frontier. It was by Beren Summers, who was a friend of, of Dr. Sengupta and actually been an inspiration to me in many, in many ways, a great, a great teacher, and I used some of his material and, and slides often. Um, but after that, uh, one would have thought there would have been quick adoption of integration of sleep into cardiovascular uh, practices and hospitals. Uh, that was not the case, and it wasn't uh, until about 17 years later, basically last year, 2022, when the American Heart Association decided to add healthy sleep to one of its essential sevens for improving and maintaining cardiovascular health, and now it's essential eight, including uh, healthy sleep. And yet, um, yet it wasn't uh, for another year or so, which was uh, this past year, that, that there was an article in circulation which asked cardiology and sleep, how do we screen, who should we screen, and who do we screen? So this has been a slow process, but it's slowly been accepted. Um, there's World Health Organization criteria for case finding, and they say something is highly prevalent with no negative impact and for which treatment is available and diagnosis is fe feasible, this warrants screening. So if we talk about obstructive sleep apnea, this is something which is highly prevalent, meeting part of the world. Uh, criteria. There's a billion people worldwide for this diagnosis, 70% of the general U.S. adult population. Um, uh, and there are many, most cases are not diagnosed. Um, is it 
Does it have negative impact? Well, if you look at Kaplan-Meier survival curve per AHI index, AHI is the apnea hypopnea index, which is the number of times per hour that a person stops breathing or breathes half the amount of normal per hour. This is per hour of sleep. If you look at the Kaplan-Meier index, you see that over time there's a significant increase in mortality associated with increasing AHI level. So the more significant the AHI level, if you see in the orange there, greater than 30, there's a very significant mortality. So there's no negative impact. What about, is there a potential for helping and changing things? If we look at uh, this article from Marin uh, in Lancet in 2005, on, on the left is fatal MI or stroke, and on the right is non-fatal MI or stroke, or need for revascularization. Re you see that as sleep apnea gets more uh, severe, that's in the red parts of, the, of these graphs, the incidence of fatal MI or stroke or, or non-fatal MI uh, continues to increase uh, dramatically. And if you look at the dotted parts of, of the of the graph, these are patients who are treated with CPAP and their mortality rates are much lower. So we're meeting World Health Organization's criteria for identifying something that should be screened. And this is this is prompted this final finally this year, which is in February, a few months ago, uh, this article, Whom to Screen and How to Screen for Obstructive Sleep Apnea in a Cardiology Clinic. So in this article, uh, they identified a series of cardiac conditions that that we should look at and try to associate. This includes, this includes resistance or refractory hypertension, non-dipping nocturnal blood pressure. Everybody's blood pressure usually goes down at night. Uh, when it doesn't, uh, it doesn't it's called non-dipping, then we should think about sleep issues. Pulmonary hypertension, neurocardial state association class two to four can dip heart failure, myocardial infarction during the nighttime, uh, monitor detected nocturnal bradycardia, atrial fibrillation, especially nocturnal, tachybrady syndrome, sick sinus syndrome, ventricular tachycardia, survivors of sudden cardiac death, ICD shocks uh, during sleep. So those are all conditions that we as cardiologists should be thinking about when we think about integrating, integrating these two fields. And I'm going to show the slides for some, at least for some of these, uh, with some data and, and cases from this hospital. So how, how, does, one, how does one screen? Uh, Generally, if you approach a cardiologist and you ask whether they do sleep, they'll say, uh, I really can't do it. If I just spend five minutes on screening patients per my day and I see 30 patients at two and a half hours, I spend wasting time. So there are targeted, there, there are screening approaches that work and can be done quickly. One is the targeted elicitation of symptoms of sleep apnea through medical history. The other are screening, screening questionnaires, which I don't know show you some of the names. These questionnaires don't have to be done by the physician himself. They can be done by members of the staff. And when the cardiologist sees the answer of those questionnaires, you know whether the person needs to be tested. Physical examination, which is something that some of us still do, and home sleep uh, studies, uh, which are very simple. So physical examination, cardiologists don't usually pick up tongue blades. But if, in fact, you do and look in the back of the throat and you see this particular this particular picture, you know, and say, this person doesn't snore, this person doesn't have sleep apnea. There's a normal, there's a normal uvula. You can see the posterior pharynx. There's no, there's no inclusion or incursion from the uh, tonsillar crypt. You look at this mouth, and within seconds, you know this person's diagnosis. There's a, there's a uh, elongated and widened and swollen uvula. There, you can't even see the posterior pharynx. If you look at mountain potty scores, this is a, would be a very high mountain potty score. What about the questionnaires? There's uh, various questionnaires here. Are some of them Berlin, Sopang, Stop, Epro Sleep, Sleep in a Scale, IAOS. All these questionnaires have relatively high sensitivity and not the best specificity. The best one out of these is the IAOS one, which I had something to do with uh, in designing. And it has a sensitivity of 95% and a specificity of 72%. If anybody wants to get this particular questionnaire, feel free to contact me. Home sleep study devices, as I mentioned, as ways of looking. There are multiple kinds. These are all uh, simple devices to use. They go on the wrist, they go on the fingers, they go uh, on the forehead. There are various ones to use. So what does uh, obstructive sleep apnea look like during sleep? Um, there, this, is a, this is a graph from one case. You can see where it says 
no airflow, that's an apneic event. Um, but right beneath, beneath that no airflow, you see there is continued effort to breathe with, with effort belts that are measuring thoracic and abdominal effort. So the person's trying to breathe, but can't because the airway is obstructed. This, if you look at these, the desaturation line, you see that, that desaturations continue well after the apnea uh, ends, and that's, that's reflective of, of uh, circulation time, really. And on top, on top of the slide, if you look at, at what says arousal, these are sympathetic discharges that occur in the brain, and they uh, really wake up a person who's been sleeping in apnea and say, you better wake up and start, start breathing, and maybe even momentary. In addition to obstructive sleep apnea, which we'll try and make sure by calling it OSA, the central sleep apnea, or CSA, central sleep apnea, the person doesn't, bleed, doesn't breathe and doesn't attempt to breathe. There is no movement of the thorax. There is no movement of the abdomen. So not breathing, not attempting to breathe, sleep apnea, not breathing, but trying to breathe. They just can't. So there are various uh, obstructive sleep apnea, pathophysiologic. Um, mechanisms that lead to disease, that lead to associated cardiovascular disease, and I'm going to quickly, uh, I am speaking quickly, and apologize, but there's a lot to cover. Uh, I'll quickly go through some of them. One are neural mechanisms, basically we're talking about sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. you think about sympathetic and parasympathetic uh, systems, uh, they're controlled for the most part by the nucleus tractus solitaris, which is in this slide in the medulla. That's, I'll, I'll shorten that by calling it NTS. This gets signals from the internal uh, uh, carotid artery, carotid body, which is very sensitive to lowering levels of oxygen. So when there's hypoxemia, the ICA sends signals to the NTS and says, this is not right, which is what happens during ap apnea. In addition, there are central chemoreceptors in the brain stem, which is very sensitive to carbon dioxide. So these central chemoreceptors also send signals to the NTS. And what does this NTS do? It sends out two other signals. One is it sends out a burst of sympathetic activation, and the other it sends out a signal to the lungs to breathe. You better breathe because oxygen is low, carbon dioxide is high. Um, the sympathetic, act, sympathetic signals that are sent out really to maintain uh, the body's equilibrium, to maintain blood pressure and survivability. So when, they, when the lungs get the signal to breathe, they start to hyperventilate to get rid of the carbon dioxide and they start to increase oxygen levels. But when the lungs uh, hyperventilate, they, they reduce, they, they um, send off thoracic afferents, which go and act as, a, uh, as negative feedback to those sympathetic activations. So the, these thoracic afferents stop the excessive thoracic, excessive sympathetic act, activation signals from the NTS. That's fine if you are breathing. What if, what if you're not breathing? What if you're apneic? So there's nothing to blunt those sympathetic activation signals. And you can measure those sympathetic activation signals by microneurographic needles. And here, if you look at a, 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 a um, graph showing what those signals look like in, in patients who have sleep apnea versus normal patients without sleep apnea, on the right side, you see the sleep apnea patients have high amplitude and high frequency of these sympathetic signals all day, all night. If you notice at the top of the slide, it says awake. These are signals recorded while the patient is not sleeping and not having apnea, but actually awake. Uh, compare that with the reduction in signals in, in patients without sleep apnea. How does that look like on, on, a, on, on a sleeping patient? If you look at the bottom, you see obstructive sleep apnea and REM during REM sleep. You see the SNA, the sympathetic nervous, nervous uh, activation signals are very high and very intense. And if you look at the blood pressure, and you, I'm sorry, you see the respiration, you see OSA events. Then you look at the blood pressure, you see there are surges of blood pressure occurring after each apneic event. So in this case, blood pressure normally, uh, let's say 150 over 70, and there are surges here to 220 over 100. This happens all night, every night, overnight. It's what we have an, ap uh, an acronym that we use the special specifically in heart failure are called AOOE, which is absolute overload overnight, every night. So this happens con consistently. What about the parasympathetic nervous system? Uh, I'm showing a sea lion here, and I'm showing this little, little, little baby. This is not the Nirvana kit for those of you who <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. This is a different, different one. But what they have in common is the diving reflex. This is a, an evolutionary mechanism for preserving life. 
sea lions breathe atmospheric air and then just stay underwater and get apnea for 30 minutes or more. When the water hits the nostrils of these babies who are put underwater, they trigger signals to the brain via the trigeminal nerve. The signals are sent via a parasympathetic system producing bradycardia and other neural pathways, which elicit peripheral vasoconstriction, reroutes blood from the limbs and the organs to preserve blood and oxygen for the heart and the brain. So that's all that's needed, the heart and the brain, and that's why the baby doesn't die when it's put underwater, and that's why the sea lions don't die. I do not suggest keeping a baby underwater for 30 minutes. So in, in this diving reflex, we see this often in sleep apnea. There are long pauses, there are heart blocks. It's very common in sleep studies. And here's an example of showing a second degree heart block and pauses occurring during the middle of a sleep study in the middle of the night. I, it's not uncommon that if you're actively involved in a sleep lab, you'll get a call from the sleep tech and say, oh, there's an eight second pause. Should we send the patient to the hospital? We say, no, just keep, just keep watching. No, no pacemaker, just treat the sleep apnea. Not only, not, only, uh, not only are rapid rhythms responsible for sudden deaths like VTAC, VTAC and VFib, but in a whole other study of congestive heart failure patients, the rhythm preceding cardiac arrest is bradycardia in a significant number. So the basic summary of these neural mechanisms is both greatly increased sympathetic tone and bradycardia associated with increased parasympathetic tone are seen with sleep disordered breathing patients and contribute to the worsening of the condition and sudden death. In addition to neural mechanisms, there are vascular mechanisms. This is a depiction of endothelial cell. Um, endothelium, endothelium, as we know, is not just an innocent bystander. It's an active uh, participator in things. This, uh, when I was in medical school, uh, I, I studied in physiology with Robert Hirschgott who won the Nobel Prize for showing, in fact, that the endothelium was very, very active. There were several of us who did research with him. He, he did not mention us whatsoever in the Nobel Prize speech. However, there, if you look at his Wikipedia page, it says uh, serendipitous findings helps them find me. We were the serendipitous, serendipitous people that helped them get to this. But the endothelium is active. It releases several things, as you all know. One is endothelin and one is nitric oxide. Endothelium causes, causes uh, vasoconstriction. Nitric oxide causes, causes uh, vasodilatation. And if you look at endothelin levels in sleep apnea patients, uh, 2200, they 10 o'clock going to sleep, and you look at them uh, four hours later after four hours of crappy um, interrupted sleep apnea uh, sleep. They have high endothelial levels, high blood pressure. You put them on CPAP, endothelin drops, and blood pressure drops. Not only that, if we look at the other substance that's sent up by the, by the uh, endothelial cells, it's uh, nitric oxide. Nitric oxide levels uh, in OSA patients are less than controlled, so when you put them on CPAP, the opposite happens. Nitric oxide levels go up. There's one more, um, there's one more mechanism of vascular mechanisms here, and that's increased adhesion molecule expression. And this was a study done uh, by Lina Lavi in Israel, and she tagged uh, the monocytes with, with radioactive chromium, and then put them in culture and put uh, put them onto endothelial cells. And you see, there's a great binding of this tag the cells by, by the endothelial cell uh, of these monocytes, much higher in, un, in a structure of apnea patients on the top versus the control patients on the bottom. And this binding and this adhesion molecules is the initial step in plaque formation. It's a binding and it causes um, abnormality. In addition, there's another mechanism which is inflammation. Last week we had a, just an amazing grand round showing the um, imaging of inflammation in plaques that was quite, quite astounding. Uh, but he did, uh, Dr. last week, did call, did mentioned Dr. Ritter, who was one of the first people looking at C-reactive protein as a predictor of uh, future cardiovascular events. As we know, uh, C-reactive protein uh, is expressed by the liver after being stimulated by interleukin-6. So if you look at people who are at high altitudes, Let's say for in this in this slide, 4,559 meters, they're hypoxemic because of the lower oxygen, oxygen level. And at day four or five at high altitude, their interleukin-6 levels go up. Concomitantly, the same thing happens with metric, with um, CRP levels. CRP levels are then increased uh, from the liver, and you have a significant increase in CRP. This is one reason, by the way, why I tell patients who are going skiing. 
that and have heart disease, you may consider using taking aspirin day two or three because day four or five, your CRP levels are going to go up significantly. So if you measure CRP levels in patients with just sleep apnea, uh, they have three times the level of control. And if you look at what happens if you put patients on CPAP, the uh, C-reactive protein levels go down to the leukin-6 levels go down. So if you look in sort of a sum summary slide here, uh, there's pro-inflammatory and atherogenic effects that occur in sleep apnea with all these inflammatory and atherogenic uh, markers. Um, there was one more mechanism, which is intrathoracic pressure changes, and here is a depiction of a heart as a union chamber heart in a, in a bottle with the bottle representing the thorax. So if you have a blood pressure of 150 in the heart and you look at a normal pressure of zero in the chest, the transmural pressure across the heart muscles, 150 minus zero, 150. If you raise the pressure, let's say by phenylephrine infusion and get to a pressure of 200, then the transmural pressure will be 200 minus zero or 200. So there's greater transmural uh, stress. However, in sleep apnea patients, there's very often negative uh, thoracic pressure. We get as low as nine, minus 90 or minus 100 when we measure it. So if you look at a sleep apnea patient in this particular depiction uh, uh, with a bottle of a pressure of minus 50, the transmural pressure will be 150 minus minus 50, or minus minus is a plus, so 150 plus 50 is 200, and therefore the transmural pressure in sleep apnea patients would be equivalent of, e of infusing phenylephrine. Uh, 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 and you can see that we measure this in, during sleep studies with um, esophageal manometry. It's, it, it's, it's pretty easy. It's, it's not gross as it seems. And you look at this particular case in a long apneic episode with the esophageal um, manometry, you see increasing and increasing negative pressures as the apnea increases. And this is what results in the significant changes that happen. And this is another depiction in this case. On the right-hand side of the slide, you see the negative markers showing exaggerated negative intrathoracic pressure. There's increased venous return. There's hypoxic uh, pulmonary artery vasoconstriction. There's moving of the septum uh, from right to left. Um, and there's this increased, increased wall stress. So what does intrathoracic pressure translate consequences? Increased wall stress, increased atrial size, impaired diastolic function, thoracic aortic dilatation and aneurysm aortic dissection. So it's in our view, every patient who has a thoracic aneurysm or every patient that you're seeing on echo who has a uh, you know, 4.2 centimeter, 8 centimeter measurement and you're following them for increasing size should get a sleep study because they'll have an intra-aortic pressure which will be, uh, if they have sleep apnea, which will be working with the negative intrathoracic pressure, they'll expand their aneurysms more quickly. So let's look at some, some, at some disease mechanisms. Uh, we won't be able to look at all of them with time constraints, but in, in firstly, we'll look at AFib, arrhythmia, and sudden cardiac death. So uh, there are a lot of uh, things associated with sleep apnea and atrial fibrillation, some that we just talked about, uh, hypoxemia, et cetera. So what about, what's, what about the obstructive sleep apnea and incident atrial fibrillation? If you have sleep apnea and you don't have any atrial fibrillation, what's the likelihood you're going to get it? This is data from Mayo Clinic. Thank you, Dr. Sengupta. Uh, this is more than 3,500 patients who had their first diagnostic sleep study. They had no current atrial fibrillation or history of atrial fibrillation. If you looked at the development of atrial fibrillation with time over 15 years, those in yellow on the bottom with no sleep apnea, about 3% of patients have atrial fibrillation. But if you look at the other colored uh, Cases of mild, moderate, severe sleep apnea by 15 years, you see there's a 20% incidence of atrial fibrillation in this in this patient group that had nothing to begin with at the time of their study. So six to seven times the likelihood that you're going to develop atrial fibrillation if you have severe sleep apnea. Also, if you have central sleep apnea, um, there's three times likelihood you're going to develop atrial fibrillation. What about the prevalence of sleep apnea in patients who um, have atrial fibrillation. Again, from the Mayo Clinic, the 520 patients studied, 150 from the Mayo Cardioversion Clinic, 373 from general cardiology practice. They were asked with one of the questionnaires and they had validated sleep studies. And if we look at, at obstructive sleep apnea present in the atrial fibrillation population, it's 49%. So basically, one out of every two patients with atrial fibrillation has sleep apnea. So 
So basically, it's an imperative almost if you have a diagnosis of atrial fibrillation to think about uh, screening and treating patients with their sleep apnea. In the general cardiolo cardiology population, it's not, not zero. It was 32%, so it's not peanuts, but much less than the patients who have uh, atrial fibrillation. What about sleep apnea and atrial fibrillation recurrence? Let's say you have atrial fibrillation and you have sleep apnea and you're cardioverted or you place an amiodarone and you're out, of, you're out of atrial fibrillation. What's the occurrence rate? Well, if you have sleep apnea and it's not treated, it's untreated by whatever way you want to treat sleep apnea, the recurrence rate was 82% in 12 months, extraordinarily high versus those treated for their sleep apnea, 42% recurrence rate. How about after catheter ablation? Does that make a difference? Does it make it less likely that patients are going to recur if they have sleep apnea? So this study by Fine in Journal of American College of Cardiology looked at patients post pulmonary vein isolation. 62 had, uh, had polysomnograms. 32 patients uh, were CPAP users. 30 patients had, were CPAP non-users. What, what, what was the recurrence rate? This is post, uh, post ablation. There was a 38% recurrence rate in CPAP users. There was a 63% recurrence rate in non-sick CPAP users. So even after ablation, there's an increase in recurrence uh, if you have uh, sleep apnea and you're not being treated. If you look at a forest plot of CPAP and recurrence in, in patients who have either GI or constant GI groups, you see it favors. What are some, some of the things that are associated with uh, Untreated with recurrence in, in untreated sleep apnea, it's, it's oxygen levels, and the oxygen levels are divided in two ways. One is percent fall in nocturnal oxygen saturation, and the other is in percent nights in nocturnal oxygen saturation less than 90 percent. So if you ever see a sleep study, one of the things you should look, look at what percentage of the night is the person. And uh, this is from the Cleveland Clinic where they show a percentage of time less than 90 percent has great greatly increasing likelihood of recurrence of atrial fibrillation. I'd like to uh, just show you one elegant study that was done talking about the about the neural systems involved in atrial fibrillation. Um, this was a role ganglionated plexi and apnea related atrial fibrillation by Chiaf in 2009. So what they did was they took dogs and made these dogs uh, apneic by, by putting them under anesthesia and then stopping their ventilation. So it was uh, induced, um, induced apnea. No ethical, no ethical uh, statements about making the dogs apnea. Anyway, they, they were apneic for two, uh, for two minutes. So during apnea, there was uh, S1 and S2 pacing five to 10 milliseconds earlier than the atrial refract refractory period. This is the kind of stuff I used to do when I did my electrophysiology fellowship. Uh, AFib was induced within 85 seconds in 9 out of 10 dogs, and AFib occurred spontaneously in one of the dogs, so the made aphid. So they recorded the uh, neural activity of the ganglion in the native plexus, and they showed that there was a significant uh, progressive increase before AFib onset. Um, in four dogs with autonomic blockade, it prevented the apnea, the autonomic blockade with beta blockers or atrophy. In protocol two, atrial fibrillation was induced by pacing near the right pulmonary artery ganglion in native plexus, eight out of 11 dogs within two minutes. And that was before neural ablation, but when they ablated this space, which was near the right pulmonary artery uh, ganglion in native plexus, they could not induce atrial fibrillation at all. So there's a combined role of elevated parasympathetic and sympathetic tone in AFib initiation. There's concurrent slowing of the heart rate and rise in systolic blood pressure, similar to the diving reflex as showed before, soon after apnea, and increased parasympathetic tone shortens atrial refractiveness, and increased sympathetic tone triggers early after depolarization. This results in AFib. So there's an inability to induce AFib after ablation. So this caused the Cleveland Clinic, uh, Natalie, who was their electrophysiologist, to come out with this following proclamation. This proclamation was, in our experience, SVC isolation is important in patients with obesity or sleep apnea. SVC is, is closer to the right pulmonary artery ganglion and plexus. So when you do ablation in patients with AFib, it's done different in patients who have obesity or sleep apnea. 
And I thought that was quite an elegant study. This is from our labs here. Uh, this is this is kind of kind of fun. This shows a during the sleep study, the person was getting CPAP, trying to get rid of their sleep apnea. And if you look at the top left, you see a very dark line. This heart, shows heart rate variability. You see a red vertical line. That ver red vertical line is a point in time in which the CPAP was just about to get rid of apnea by achieving the right CPAP pressure. If you look at the rhythm on the bottom, it's atrial fibrillation. 30 seconds later, the CPAP started to get rid of apnea. And look at the rhythm on the bottom, you see atrial fibrillation. All of a sudden, there's conversion of atrial fibrillation into sinus rhythm. And for the rest of the night, the person on CPAP stayed in sinus rhythm. Now, this person happened to have been in atrial fibrillation for three years, and he had this study. And now, as far as I know, he's never been in atrial fibrillation again, and he's a regular CPAP user. So it was a kind of cool thing uh, to see and something that we see not infrequently. Um, what about other arrhythmias of sudden cardiac death? Um, Mark Twain had the same statement, which is, don't go to sleep, people tend to die there. The question is, was Mark Twain right? Well, if you look at the mortality data from the Wisconsin sleep cohort, there was 18-year follow-up of 1,500 patients, all cause mortality was two to three times greater in those with obstructive sleep apnea versus no obstructive sleep apnea. Cardiovascular mortality was five to six times greater. If you look at the at the times where patients with OSA have heart attacks, uh, in, in this in this slide is in, in the black the black um, boxes there. You see the most prevalent type of heart attack in these patients is 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. This is different than what we were all thought. Certainly, what I was thought. Heart attacks occur in the morning. And there are multiple reasons relating uh, sleep abnormalities to heart attacks in the morning. I won't get into that. But in patients with sleep apnea, their heart attacks are occurring at night between 10 p.m. and 8 a.m. Not only uh, heart attacks, but sudden death occurs. And if you look on the left slide, left side of the slide, you see the increase in sudden death uh, from cardiac causes uh, much higher uh, during midnight to 6 a.m. episode in these patients. Um, and the cohort of patients that were studied after undergoing their first uh, study, over 10,000 patients that were followed for 15 years with an average of 5.3 years, 142 patients had sudden cardiac death. This is an annual rate of 0.27%. This is four times the annual sudden cardiac death rate that exists in the country. In independent factors were looked at to see what, caused, what was associated with sudden cardiac death. It was age greater than 60, apnea hypopnea index greater than 20, mean oxygen saturation lower and lowest nocturnal oxygen saturation less than 78%. So this has impact on our, on our patient population who have heart failure, have ICDs. We look at their data. We look when their patients come into clinic. Well, what happened? Are they having shocks? Are they not having shocks? Are they having shocks? When? So in this study by Sarazawa, there were 71 patients with heart failure and ICD studies for 180 days after a sleep study, all had ejection fractions less than 35%. 66% of these had sleep disorder breathing. Appropriate shocks from their ICD occurred in 43% the sleep disorder breathing, and shocks occurred from 12 a.m. to 6 a.m. in 34% of these patients versus 17% without sleep disorder breathing. Thus, the, the sleep apnea in patients with heart failure and ICDs is an independent predictor of life-threatening arrhythmia more likely to occur during sleep. Is this just a theory, or does this happen here in our hospital? Well, here's a case just two weeks ago. This was uh, sent, sent to me by Dr. Omelecki, who implanted a defibrillator in this patient. And then she downloaded the data from, from her interrogation of the of the defibrillator, and this person had shock occurring at 4.30 in the morning with ventricular fibrillation. And she thought, whoa, maybe this person should have a sleep study. So she sent this information to me, and she sent the patient to me. This is data from this patient's sleep study. Showed an apnea hypopnea index of 65, which is markedly abnormal, markedly severe. Not only that, but 77% of the time of the night, the patient had an oxygen saturation of less than 90%. So here was a here in this hospital in our patient population, uh, a shock associated with a very significant sleep apnea occurring in the middle of the night. This patient is now 
being uh, undergoing uh, treatment for the sleep apnea. Uh, not only is there sudden, there's sudden cardiac death in patients who have disease, but there's sudden unexplained nocturnal death which occurs in, in, in other patients. In, in, our, in our world, it's Brugada syndrome. In other worlds, it's, uh, it's called other things. In South, Brugada is more common in Southeast Asian men. It's called sudden unexplained nocturnal death or sun. This is a typical EKG we see with uh, Brugada, which is the abnormal uh, SC segment in the right side of the precordial veins. This is a, be a type one. If you don't see it, you suspect you, you can uh, you can uh, try and provoke it by certain like flaconide or other methods. You can try and provoke the the the, uh, the, the EKG sign of Brugada. What about Brugada patient? It's a genetic disease. It's a mutation, SCN5A gene that encodes for the sodium ion. It leads to sudden death by ventricular fibrillation. Well, Brugada is responsible for 4% of all sudden cardi cardiac deaths and almost 20% of deaths in patients without structural heart disease. And these Brugada patients, 45% had at least moderate obstructive sleep apnea, even in the face of normal BMI. So these are not obese patients. They have their, their normal stature and they have at least moderate obstructive sleep apnea. And two out of three patients with classic Brugada EKG in sudden death had obstructive sleep apnea. So there, I can't tell you that in fact, if you treat their sleep apnea, it's going to change things, but there's this is association with uh, Brugada. This is another patient from here. Um, I'm a clicker, but if, if you look, if you look, this is a a sleep study, you see the red line, that's the red, red, that's the line showing breathing. You see the flat line toward the left side of, of, the, of this graph. That's an apneic event. And following the apneic event, if you look up at the top, you see all that all that commotion, and that's those are arousals, which are the sympathetic discharges that go on to wake up the person and say to say breathe. Well arousals were associated with ventricular tachycardia, and in this particular case, you see the apnea and you see the ventricular tachycardia occurring. This is the same patient after being put on CPAP, nice, steady, normal breathing, and no evidence of tachycardia. Take home message, patients with sleep apnea have three to six times the likelihood of fatal and non-fatal cardiovascular events in 10, 18 years, two to three times all cause mortality. They have AICD shocks during the night, MIs during the night, they die during the night, they have higher risk of sudden death. That's not the case with patients who don't have sleep. How are we doing? Little. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit of heart about heart failure. Um, heart failure is you know, ubiquitous, ubiquitous, the biggest users of, uh, of dollars in the cardiovascular space. So in a study of an entire Danish population, uh, whole entire country from 2000 to 2012, they looked at patients with sleep apnea, both receiving and not receiving sleep apnea, they were identified and compared to the background population. Patients without congestive heart failure, but who were diagnosed with sleep apnea, had a very significant increase in subsequent risk of incident congestive heart failure. So if you have obstructive sleep apnea, you know we have a higher risk of developing AFib, and now you know we have a higher risk of developing down the line um, congestive heart failure. And the use of CPAP lowered that risk, and I have some data slides to show you why it might reduce that risk, but we're getting short on time. So this is a graph showing that. So OSA is considered as a cause of congestive heart failure. CSA, or central CPAP apnea, is considered a response to heart failure. That's the, one of the major differences. So this is a big uh, slide of showing, showing the reasons and why obstructive sleep apnea can cause heart failure. These are all mechanisms we kind of quickly went through before, but obstructive sleep apnea can lead to, uh, to congestive heart failure. On the other hand, in this slide, you see central apnea in yellow on the right. These patients have heart failure. They go into pulmonary edema. There's pulmonary afferent stimulation. They hyperventilate. Uh, you know, there's, there is, uh, what, what is PND? You know, we, I didn't, wasn't always clear what PND is. I think I know now more, and that is a patient with heart failure and PND that have central 
sleep apnea and, and they're having chain soap respirations or they're having essential sleep apnea epi episodes. So central sleep apnea, they're hyperventilating, the, oxygen, the carbon dioxide levels go down, and now there's no stimulus to breathing with low carbon dioxide. So they stop breathing and they develop central sleep apnea and then you get this cascade of events that result in, in congestive heart failure. And in fact, Kasai in this article in circulation talked about a bi-directional relationship between obstructive and central sleep apnea and heart failure. The general quick uh, overview, OSA is highly prevalent and associated with adverse outcomes in CHF. Our patients with CHF are also increased Patients who have congestive heart failure, as I showed you, have increased development of central sleep apnea. The overall prevalence is somewhere between 40 to 60 percent, with OSA being about a third of cases. Most studies reported OSA and CSA roughly equal, but in a meta-analysis, one of the 2,500 patients who had moderate to severe sleep apnea, central sleep apnea represented the dominant phenotype in 70 percent of cases. And that is a big problem for us in, in the heart failure and sleep world, that central sleep apnea is so predominant. We know central sleep apnea increases the risk of heart failure uh, readmission. And you look at this study, and 50% of heart failure patients who had central sleep apnea were readmitted to hospitals in six months. Over 25% of heart failure patients with CSA had two or more hospital readmissions within six months. Central sleep apnea is not a good thing. What do we do about it? Well, can, what should we do about it in the hospital? Is there anything we, we can do? Can we screen and treat patients in hospital? Shall we consider doing this, let's say, on fixed tower? And this study showed 104 consecutive patients who were admitted to various cardiac conditions uh, and were studied just after their admission with in-hospital portable sleep studies. Uh, the, the result of that was 78% had sleep apnea, 80% were obstructive, 20% were central. They were started on CPAP in the hospital while it was still here, and then compliance data was looked at. Compliance was considered using CPAP more than four hours per night and at least 70% of the nights. Compliance with CPAP is a major problem, as you all know. Uh, so what was the readmission data on this patient population? People who were CPAP adherent, 30-day readmission rate, zero. Partial CPAP use or no CPAP use readmission rate was about 30%. The take home message is that screening and treating patients is possible in inpatients and reduces readmissions, which is something we always try to do. Um, what about sleep disorder breathing and discharge mortality uh, in patients with heart failure? So, this was a single center study by Kayat's group in Ohio State. More than 1,100 patients. 31% uh, had central sleep apnea, 47% had obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, clearly, the ones that had sleep apnea, either obstructive or central, had very high mortality rates. Uh, the, the mortality rates looking at 30% plus 36 months. Those who had no or minimal sleep disorder breathing had a much less mortality rate. When you looked at the patients post post-discharge survival by treatment stage, you see the same survival rate in the dotted lines in this graph, but you look at the top of the graph in the solid lines, mortality rate is much, much less than those who are treated. But our treatment uh, options, the CPAP, is bypass, is adaptive servo ventilation called ASV, phrenic nerve stimulation. Um, so there are a bunch of studies. I'm not going to, I have a bunch of slides that I'm actually going to just sort of quickly ignore them, other than tell you the largest study done looking at treating heart failure patients with adaptive servo ventilation, which is a kind of CPAP, kind of BiPAP, I'm sorry, which is adapted to help treat patients, what everybody used to treat heart failure patients, including me. Including me. And there was a large study in the early 2010s. Patients had ejection fraction less than 45%. They had AHI 315, central predominant. The primary endpoint was all cause mortality, life saving cardiovascular intervention, and unplanned CHF hospitalization. So there was a reveal in this meeting, in sleep, one of the sleep meetings, and it was packed with people. I was one of the people because we couldn't wait to get valid, get valid validation of what we were doing. And it was a, one of the shocks of all time. 
because the result was there was no difference in the primary endpoint with a trend favoring the control group. But even worse than that, if we look at cardiovascular mortality, is a 2.5% absolute increased risk of annual cardiovascular mortality and something we were all doing because, in fact, we thought we were saving lives. And so there was a paradigm shift in what we were doing to treat patients with central to gut congestive heart failure. And everybody was advised that ASV is contraindicated for patients, treatment of patients with CSA and symptomatic heart failure and injection fractions less than 45%. That is still the case. There was a subsequent study which was ended quickly, which did show positive effects of ASV if they had preserved injection fraction. Another study looked at similar kind of stuff, and I won't go into the, all the details other than show again there was no significant difference in endpoints. But if you look at post hoc analysis of what happened to mortality rates, there was a hazard ratio kind of showing a 22% reduction in mortality, but the p-value was not particularly great, so it wasn't significant. Now there's a, a, one more trial going on called, called, called LOFT, heart failure, and this was a, a $17 million grant to uh, Ohio State and a hospital in Boston to look at the effects of oxygen on these patients. So Robert Wood under Dr. Sengupta is in the process of getting a $50 million grant to look to look at how we treat congestive heart failure. So this, this trial is still in progress. We have no, no results. Um, lastly, I'm just going to talk about treatment by implanted devices. Those of you fellows who are doing electrophysiology uh, or thinking about it, there are implantable devices. There's a hypoglossal nerve stimulation. All of you who watch television every night know what this is. Those are always ads about these people who got rid of their CPAP, they're feeling like a million dollars, and they got to move back into the bedroom with their spouses. And in fact, when you look at hypoglossal nerve simulation, it's not really indicated for heart failure. There's a whole bunch of criteria that you, but it is very good for sleep apnea. This implanted device, phrenic nerve stimulator, is implanted by electrophysiologists. There's a sensing lead, there's a stimulation lead, and this is really incredibly good. Uh, and it definitely gets rid of central CPAP, yeah, and there's incoming data every day. Uh, the people that developed this, um, friends of mine, I was running a heart failure pulmonary hypertension clinic in Flagstaff, Arizona, and I got a call from, from you know, Robin Germany, she was head of heart failure in Oklahoma, and she said, you know, you're up in Flagstaff, there's 8,000 feet up in the air, do you have patients on central CPAP? And I said, that's all we got up here, they all have central I sent patients from Slack, I said, leave, go to Phoenix, and you'll be better. And she said, well, I want to try and devise something that's going to help these patients. She ultimately did, and this is where the transphrenic nerve simulation started. So just a quick summary then about sleep apnea and heart failure. OSA is prevalent, may be associated with disease progression. Central apnea is prevalent and sometimes precipitated by heart failure. Sleep apnea is associated with increased post-discharge mortality and hospital readmissions and acute heart failure. There are CPAP benefits in congestive heart failure if there's preserved ejection fraction, it's obstructive and less central. ASV is currently not indicated in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and CSA. That's one of the questions on your mock, mock sub. Unilateral transvenous phrenic stimulation holds promise as a novel therapy in patients with CSA by significantly reducing events and improving functional outcomes. I'm going to stop here because it's just lots of material. Take any questions I have. It's not a Thank you. Thank you very much. You, if you want to just uh, uh, come up your uh, slides uh, and share the screen as well as, yes, so that people can see uh, us. Uh, in, First of all, I think um, it's very clear uh, that this is not a journey with sleep apnea. This is uh, the love and passion that you have with the topic. And what comes out very, uh, very clearly is um, that, uh, you know, and this particularly for our trainees, is to see that the passion with which uh, he has gone with the work, uh, places, travel, developed it, and he continues to transmit that. And he has developed the knowledge, he has developed the service component, and he clearly enjoys it. And 
the last component, the enjoyment of the joy of serving and the joy of the knowledge and contribution and a meaningful way to lead, lead your own um, profession is very clear. So uh, I, I just want to make sure that uh, I, I hope everyone is able to enjoy what you have done and thank you for your contributions. And you. uh, even um, uh, even though we know that uh, the roles of academics and uh, entrepreneurship and, and, and conventional and unconventional medicines are not very well recognized, I want to make sure that this grand round represents um, uh, a, a very strong indicator of what is the kind of people and, and their pursuits that we really value. So thank you very much for doing this. Mm -hmm. uh, and with that, I want to make bring, uh, uh, first of all, uh, it is very clear, uh, as you mentioned, that AFib and hypertension, maybe one in three or one in two people may end up having it. So clearly we don't prescribe with that frequency or do we screen with that frequency. So it's clearly under-recognized even within the cardiology community and people do not do a good job. Maybe there's a kind of a stigma, I would say, associated with sleep apnea because people get scared and the family of, of, of owning or disowning yourself or your surroundings or the way you're going to lead your life. How much that's been a problem and what is the technological solution or breakthrough you think will allow us to removing that fear of getting labeled that you're going to... I mean, there's a high degree of, as you mentioned, uh, compliance issue, lack of compliance. Mm -hmm. And it's because just the gadgets and the way you have to wear it and do it, it appears very cumbersome with everybody's lifestyle. So people are not really motivated. What is the breakthrough that we need to get through this enigma? I mean, there, there are several, uh, there are multiple breakthroughs. Certain, I didn't discuss whatsoever, lots of technology that's out there at, at the moment being developed, which will help get rid of some of the cumbersome stuff. And I didn't discuss artificial intelligence use in the diagnosis, which which is I'm currently using in, in one one aspect within my practice. Uh, and I didn't discuss the development of medications which are being developed to treat uh, sleep apnea. So, but you're right, there's a stigma. There are people who don't want to, who will say, I'm not going to be tested because I'll never use that thing on my face. Uh, I have a hundred or so videos on my phone from patients who swear they will never go anywhere without their CPAP, and I use those videos when I, when I uh, try and convince, convince patients. But yeah, there is a stigma and it's, and it's difficult. But um, there are significant, there's significant advances. It, it, it's mind-boggling how quickly it changes. I can tell you, we talked a lot about AHI, uh, after the hypopnea index, and, I, and everybody looks at an AHI of 60, they say, okay, this is like really bad. But every AHI is not equal to every other AHI. And I have you know, 30, 40 slides of the exact same AHI with patients side by side. And you can just look at these slides with the patients, their eyes black, blacked out. You say, those are not the same patients. So there are multiple things that are being developed. And there's stigma. Part of the issue also is, you know, turf. What's the turf? And cardiologists have always been, you know, in the forefront of everything. And when cardiologists started to go into sleep, you know, pulmonologists were particularly thrilled because, you know, we put in stents, we put in pacemakers, we put in defibrillators. We do everything to save people. Now you're now you are intruding on in our world of sleep. But the truth of the matter is, the development of the field of sleep started from, not from pulmonology, but from neurology. Uh, and there are neurologists, there are pulmonologists, there are psychiatrists, there are cardiologists, all involved in, in this field. It's really right. It's it's very um, daunting, but it's it's very gratifying as well. And for you guys, just, you can do. So our trainees are here, so in the in the room. So I'm going to open this up for discussion. And please feel free to ask him any question related to sleep apnea or anything else. I have a ton of questions, but thank you so much for this excellent and eye-opening talk. Um, uh, my first question, and I'll be generous and let you guys answer questions, ask questions too. But my first question is, you know, we're taught that 
40, uh, like within 48 hours post MI, there's VT, is probably really related to like reperfusion, but after the 48 hours, um, if there's VT, we consider that secondary prevention. So in your, as an, an indication for ICD. So in your opinion, do you think that we should be looking at, you know, maybe testing and treating patients for OSA in, in you know, who has that in that population, like could this be like a reversible um, cause of VT potentially? It's a harder patient population to test, mm -hmm. and I don't know, I really don't know the data. I do, I, and we do know that, that there is a significant association with VT, but these are all patients post-acute event. I mean, it's mm -hmm. kind of similar to having a waiting period, you know, yeah. before you put in a device. Uh, Post infarct. I don't know the exact answer, but there is certainly, if the patient has, it should be something that should be carefully looked at and thought about the value. You, you, you spoke about screening, um, and it, it really starts on the front lines. So I agree. Um, and to your point, the cardiologists say they don't have time to do a simple questionnaire, um, I think it, it, it might be helpful to involve um, the PCPs as well in that screening effort because and now that they have more bandwidth, they probably have less than we do, but um, you know, it helps they see a larger number of patients than we do too as well. So I yeah. think it, it, it would help if it's a coordinated effort for everyone. Oh yeah, the screening questionnaires, you know, the thought behind them was, you know, this is a quick way of, of uh, screening patients, and it doesn't have to be done by the doctor. It doesn't have to even be done by, you know, a PA or an, or an NP. Uh, there are just multiple places where patients register and they're given this screening questionnaire. Then it's given to the doctor. Um, when the patient walks in the room, the doctor looks at this questionnaire and has an answer within seconds. You know, that doesn't mean you should not look look further. But if the questionnaires are positive, it's, it's a cinch. In fact, in, in multiple systems that I've worked with, these include dentists and, and other providers of care. They've used these questionnaires, and, and they then have somebody in large practices sitting in a room, and they'll say, okay, you know, you filled out this questionnaire. It's highly likely you have a problem with your sleep that I have. I have drawn down the hall in that room, and we'd like to have you go over there and discuss the things that we'd like to do to follow up on this question. So let me ask a provocative question. So it, it seems like uh, sleep apnea has a very strong clustering trend. In, I mean, you have AFib, hypertension, heart failure. Uh, what is the, I mean, why not everybody who's got this disorder be screened? Why do you need even a questionnaire? Everybody who has. Any of these, uh, any of this disorders, which are, I'm not, I'm not mentioning any cardiovascular disease. Let's say a clustering of the highest frequency disorders like AFib, hypertension. They should all, the answer they should be, but you know, this concept of screening everybody is a concept that's fraught with lots of issues. Right, but right. with the screening devices the screening and home device. monitoring and variables coming into the picture with sleep, people are like monitoring everything, right? I'm yeah. sure that they're, they're not, they should be open to monitoring how well they sleep. They do, and there's multiple devices measuring how well people sleep. Um, a lot of them not particularly, not particularly great, and many of them dealing just with actigraphy which measures motion, mm -hmm. and you know, sleep is, is determined by lack of motion in these, in these devices that are used. Um, but, yes. So you could, have, you could develop a mattress or like some kind of a sheet with all kinds of sensors, there is. and you should be able to sleep on that, there and is. you should be able to monitor everything. You don't have to develop it. It exists okay. already. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, yeah. so, I mean, it should be a very easy way for us to create at least a high... So in cardiology, in cardiology practice and practices that we dealt with, we just used this screening tool and basically the, the, the levels are so high. I didn't, in the issue of time, I didn't show certain things. In my freestanding cath lab, 
we did a study of. What do you mean by freestanding cath lab? I just want everybody to understand. I had a cath lab in my office. Okay. Can uh, you explain a little bit more? <laughs> <laughs> I did, after doing about 2,000 catheterizations, one day I said, why am I doing a catheterization in the hospital? It's just silly. And then um, started looking at, at ways of doing it outside of the hospital. Um, and I did, personally, I didn't know whether legally I could do it. And I went to a great uh, lawyer, uh, healthcare lawyer, his name is Barry Ostrowski, who turned out to be the CEO of one of his, Barbara Johnson, whatever, whatever it's called here. Uh, and I said, Barry, can I do this? And he said, yes, you can. It won't be easy. Nobody's going to love you for doing this, but you can do it. I said, I mean, somebody sues me, will I win? He said, yes, you will win. So then I started uh, looking at method, methods of doing cardiac cath. And this was obviously a long time ago. I'm pretty old. But um, I was friendly with Grunzig, the guy who developed angioplasty. And he had, um, he had decided to, to, to have a cath lab in Emory outside of the hospital. And he used this, fish, this, this system devised by Fisher, which was the only really accurate um, digital imaging system at 30 frames per second. All the big name boys, whether it was GE, Cubs, had systems that were not particularly ac accurate. He decided that this was accurate. I got to look at it. I thought it was incredible. And I said, I'm going to do this in the truth. So I did. I opened the cath lab. So it was the first digital cath lab in the Northeast. And we used very small catheters. Uh, and the, I just remember the first cath conference that I came to after doing two cases, I brought, I want to show some cases. And they said, where's your film? I said, I don't have film, but I have this thing here. And they said, what? Everybody was like, what are you talking about? So I had digital, digital imaging stuff. But we developed, uh, we used smaller and smaller catheters. We developed uh, intracoronary uh, power injection, which ultimately everybody started to do. Um, and so after doing about a couple hundred cases, uh, I got a, a letter from the Attorney General and the, and the Commissioner of Health from our wonderful state asking me to come down to Trenton. And I went down and I asked Barry, I'm in trouble. I said, what should I bring you? He said, no, don't come with any lawyer, just go down. And I went down and they said, um, we understand that you're doing cardiac catheterization in your office. Yes, I am. And they said, well, we're going to shut you down. I said, why? They said, we, we don't like you. That was the answer. We don't like you. And I said, I'm hoping for something more substantive. Um, I can't say the same because I don't know well you, I don't know you well enough to say I don't like you. But anyway, so they tried. I kept doing cases. They tried. And finally, after a bunch of months, the Commissioner of Health called me down again and said, you know what? Uh, we are going to give you uh, a um, pilot project uh, certificate of need. So you can, you can provide all this information to us. We can look at what you're doing. We can look at the uh, cost effectiveness and the morbidity and mortality. Meanwhile, I knew if, I, if there was one case that went wrong, I was toast. So clearly, we were very, very careful. Um, and so I said, that's so wonderful. I'm so happy. I have tons of data to provide you already. And then so 30 days went by, 60 days, 90 days went by, and I got nothing. And then there was a new commissioner of health. New commissioner of health came in and called me down the trend and said, we're going to shut you down. I said, I have, a, I have a deal with your predecessor. I know, but I don't like you. You know what? This time I can say the feeling is mutual. <laughs> so, <laughs> so ultimately, ultimately uh, they took me to court, and the court case, the court case went to court. Um, I'll give you a guess as to how long that case lasted in court. Any guesses? Six days. Five years. One day. Quarter. <laughs> <laughs> one hour. One hour. Wow. One hour. At the end of the hour, the judge said, case dismissed. Thank you, Weissel. You can do anything you want in your office. 
and I do open heart surgery. <laughs> <laughs> so we went out, we, we wound up doing about 15,000 counts in this. In this wow. Place. Yeah. It had the lowest morbidity and mortality of any cap out in the state. Ultimately, kind of decided not to do it because, uh, not to continue after a bunch of years just because things were changing so much with intervention. Um, but we had really amazing, amazing stuff. It was incredibly efficient. We had 10 minute turnover between cases. Wow. So I, I thought this was an important story for all of you to hear because it's not about sleep, but it talks about persistence, determination, and foresight to be able to do something that you really like to do. And and and, uh, and now I think Dr. Weisbogel is wanting to give back and, and he's more interested to uh, be part of uh, uh, programs, uh, how can he work with us, uh, fellows wanting to spend time in the evening and go and talk to him and learn about some cool stuff and all the things. I mean, I'm open to these kind of uh, collaborations and mentorship opportunities, so we want to thank you again for, I'm sure there may be many other questions, but I think we'll develop uh, some fireside chats uh, later on in the year, uh, in the next academic year or so. But I wanted to bring in a, a, like a very non-traditional side of cardiology that sometimes uh, goes around our academic environments and remains unknown or not recognized. So, so that is important for us to see. So thank you for thank you. all the contributions over the years and we'll look forward to continuing some forms of collaboration and, so. uh, and, and more to come on that. So. With that note, goodbye. Thank you.